Animal Farm by George Orwell Chapter 10 Years passed. The seasons came and went. The short animal lives fled by. A time came when there was no one who remembered the old days before the rebellion except Clover, Benjamin, Moses the Raven and a number of the pigs. Muriel was dead. Bluebell, Jessie and Pincher were dead. Jones too was dead. He had died in an inebriate's home in another part of the country. Snowball was forgotten. Boxer was forgotten. Except by the few who had known him. Clover was an old stout mare now, stiff in the joints and with a tendency to roomy eyes. She was two years past the retiring age, but in fact no animal had ever actually retired. The talk of setting aside a corner of the pasture for superannuated animals had long since been dropped. Napoleon was now a mature boar of twenty-four stone. Squealer was so fat that he could with difficulty see out of his eyes. Only old Benjamin was much the same as ever, except for being a little greyer about the muzzle, and since Boxer's death, more morose and taciturn than ever. There were many more creatures on the farm now, though the increase was not so great as had been expected in earlier years. Many animals had been born to whom the rebellion was only a dim tradition, passed on by word of mouth, and others had been bought who had never heard mention of such a thing before their arrival. The farm possessed three horses now besides Clover. They were fine upstanding beasts, willing workers and good comrades, but very stupid. None of them proved able to learn the alphabet beyond the letter B. They accepted everything that they were told about the rebellion and the principles of animalism, especially from Clover, for whom they had an almost filial respect, but it was doubtful whether they understood very much of it. The farm was more prosperous now and better organised. It had even been enlarged by two fields which had been bought from Mr Pilkington. The windmill had been successfully completed at last, and the farm possessed a threshing machine and a hay elevator of its own, and various new buildings had been added to it. Wimper bought himself a dog cart. The windmill, however, had not, after all, been used for generating electrical power. It was used for milling corn, and brought in a handsome money profit. The animals were hard at work building yet another windmill. When that one was finished, so it was said, the dynamos would be installed, but the luxuries of which Snowball had once taught the animals to dream, the stalls with electric light and hot and cold water, and the three-day week were no longer talked about. Napoleon had denounced such ideas as contrary to the spirit of animalism. The truest happiness, he said, lay in working hard and living frugally. Somehow it seemed as though the farm had grown richer without making the animals themselves any richer, except, of course, for the pigs and dogs. Perhaps this was partly because there were so many pigs and so many dogs. It was not that these creatures did not work, after their fashion. There was, as Squealer was never tired of explaining, endless work in the supervision and organisation of the farm. Much of this work was of a kind that the other animals are too ignorant to understand. For example, Squealer told them that the pigs had to expand enormous labours every day upon mysterious things called files and reports and minutes and memoranda. These were large sheets of paper which had to be closely covered with writing, and as soon as they were so covered they were burnt in the furnace. This was of the highest importance for the welfare of the farm. But still, neither pigs nor dogs produced any food by their own labour, and there were very many of them, and their appetites were always good. As for the others, their life, so far as they knew, was as it had always been. They were generally hungry, they slept on straw, they drank from the pool, they laboured in the fields, and in winter they were troubled by the cold, in summer by the flies. Sometimes the older ones among them racked their dim memories and tried to determine whether in the early days of the rebellion, when Jordan's expulsion was still recent, things had been better or worse than now. They could not remember. There was nothing with which they could compare their present lives. They had nothing to go on except the squealer's list of figures, which invariably demonstrated that everything was getting better and better. The animals found the problem insoluble. In any case, they had little time for speculating on such things now. Only old Benjamin professed to remember every detail of his long life, and to know that things had never been or never could be much better or worse hunger, hardship and disappointment being, so he said, the unalterable roar of life. 
And yet the animals never gave up hope. More, they never lost even for an instant their sense of honour and privilege in all being members of Animal Farm. They were still the only farm in the whole country, in all of England, owned and operated by animals. Not one of them, not even the youngest, not even the newcomers who had been brought from other farms ten or twenty miles away, ever ceased to marvel at that. And when they heard the gun booming and saw the green flag fluttering at the masthead, their hearts swelled with imperishable pride, and the talk turned always towards the old heroic days, the expulsion of jaunts, the writing of the Seven Commandments, the great battles in which the human invaders had been defeated. None of the old dreams had been abandoned. The Republic of the Animals which Major had foretold, when the green fields of England should be untrodden by human feet, was still believed in. Some day it was coming. It might not be soon, it might not be within the lifetime of any animal now living, but still it was coming. Even the tune of Beasts of England was perhaps hummed secretly here and there. At any rate, it was a fact that every animal on the farm knew it, though no one would have dared sing it aloud. It might be that their lives were hard and that not all of their hopes had been fulfilled, but they were conscious that they were not as other animals. If they went hungry, it was not from feeding tyrannical human beings. If they worked hard, at least they worked for themselves. No creature among them went up on two legs. No creature called any other creature master. All animals were equal. One day, in early summer, Squealer ordered the sheep to follow him and led them out to a piece of waste ground at the other end of the farm, which had become overgrown with birch saplings. The sheep spent the whole day there browsing at the leaves under Squealer's supervision. In the evening he returned to the farmhouse himself, but as it was warm weather told the sheep to stay where they were. It ended by their remaining there for a whole week, during which time the other animals saw nothing of them. Squealer was with them for the greater part of every day. He was, he said, teaching them to sing a new song, for which privacy was needed. It was just after the sheep had returned, on a pleasant evening, when the animals had finished work and were making their way back to the farm buildings, that the terrified neighing of a horse sounded from the yard. Startled, the animals stopped in their tracks. It was Clover's voice. She neighed again, and all the animals broke into a gallop and rushed into the yard, and they saw what Clover had seen. It was a pig, walking on his hind legs. Yes, it was Squealer. A little awkwardly, as though not quite used to supporting his considerable bulk in that position, but with perfect balance, he was strolling across the yard. And a moment later, out from the door of the farmhouse came a long file of pigs, all walking on their hind legs. Some did it better than others. One or two were even a trifle unsteady and looked as though they would have liked the support of a stick. But every one of them made his way right round the yard successfully, and finally there was a tremendous baying of dogs and a shrill crowing from the back cockerel, and out came Napoleon himself, majestically upright, casting haughty glances from side to side, and with his dogs gambling around him. He carried a whip in his trotter. There was a deadly silence. Amazed, terrified, huddling together, the animals watched the long line of pigs march slowly round the yard. It was as though the world had turned upside down, and then there came a moment when the first shock had worn off, and when, in spite of everything, in spite of their terror of the dogs and of the habit, developed through long years of never complaining, never criticising, no matter what happened, they might have uttered some word of protest, but just at that moment, as though as a signal, all the sheep burst out into a tremendous bleating of four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better, four legs good, two legs better. It went on for five minutes without stopping, and by the time the sheep had quieted down, the chance to utter any protest had passed for the pigs had marched back into the farmhouse. Benjamin felt a nose nuzzling at his shoulder. He looked round. It was Clover. Her old eyes looked dimmer than ever. Without saying anything, she tugged gently at his mane and led him round to the end of the big barn, where the seven commandments were written. For a minute or two they stood gazing at the tattered wall with its white lettering. My sight is failing, she said finally. 
Even when I was young, I could not have read what was written there. But it appears to me that the wall looks different. Are the seven commandments the same as they used to be, Benjamin? For once, Benjamin consented to break his rule, and he read out to her what was written on the wall. There was nothing there now except a single commandment. It ran, All animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. After that, it did not seem strange, nor the next day the pigs who were supervising the work of the farm all carried whips in their trotters. It did not seem strange to learn that the pigs had brought themselves a wireless set, were arranging to install a telephone, had taken out subscriptions to John Bull, Tidbits and the Daily Mirror. It did not seem strange when Napoleon was seen strolling in the farmhouse garden with a pipe in his mouth. No, not even when the pigs took Mr Jones's claws out the wardrobes and put them on, Napoleon himself appearing in a black coat, rack catcher breeches and leather leggings, while his favourite sow appeared in a watered silk dress which Mrs Jones had been used to wearing on Sundays. A week later, in the afternoon, a number of dog carts drove up to the farm. A deputation of neighbouring farmers had been invited to make a tour of inspection. They were shown all over the farm and expressed great admiration for everything they saw, especially the windmill. The animals were weeding the turnip field. They worked diligently, hardly raising their faces from the ground, and not knowing whether to be more frightened of the pigs or of the human visitors. That evening, loud laughter and bursts of singing came from the farmhouse, and suddenly, at the sound of the mingled voices, the animals were stricken with curiosity. What could be happening in there, now that for the first time animals and human beings were meeting on terms of equality? With one accord they began to creep as quietly as possible into the farmhouse garden. At the gate they paused, half frightened to go on, but Clover led the way in. They tiptoed up to the house, and such animals as were tall enough peered in at the dining room window. There, round the long table, sat half a dozen farmers and half a dozen of the more eminent pigs, Napoleon himself occupying the seat of honour at the head of the table. The pigs appeared completely at ease in their chairs. The company had been enjoying a game of cards, but had broken off for the moment, evidently in order to drink a toast. A large jug was circulating, and the mugs were being refilled with beer. No one noticed the wondering faces of the animals that gazed in at the window. Mr Pilkington of Foxwood had stood up, his mug in his hand. In a moment, he said, he would ask the present company to drink a toast, but before doing so there were a few words that he felt it incumbent upon him to say. It was a source of great satisfaction to him, he said, and he was sure to all others present to feel that a long period of mistrust and misunderstanding had now come to an end. There had been a time, not that he or any of the present company had shared such sentiments, but there had been a time when the respected proprietors of Animal Farm had been regarded, uh, he would not say with hostility, but perhaps with a certain measure of misgiving by their human neighbours. Unfortunate incidents had occurred, mistaken ideas had been current, it had been felt that the existence of a farm owned and operated by pigs was somehow abnormal and was liable to have an unsettling effect in the neighbourhood. Too many farmers had assumed, without due inquiry, that on such a farm a spirit of licence and indiscipline would prevail. They had been nervous about the effects upon their own animals, or even upon their human employees. But all such doubts were now dispelled. Today he and his friends had visited Animal Farm and inspected every inch of it with their own eyes, and what did they find? Not only the most up-to-date methods, but a discipline and an orderliness which should be an example to all farmers everywhere. He believed that he was right in saying that the lower animals of Animal Farm did more work and received less food than any animals in the county. Indeed, he and his fellow visitors today had observed many features which they intended to introduce on their own farms immediately. He would end his remarks, he said, by emphasising once again the friendly feelings that subsisted and ought to subsist between Animal Farm and its neighbours. Between pigs and human beings there was not, and there need not be, any clash of interest whatever. Their struggles and their difficulties were one. Was not the labour problem the same everywhere? Here it became apparent that Mr Pilkington was about to spring some carefully prepared witticism on the company, but for a moment he was too overcome by amusement to be able to utter it. After much chalking, during which his various chins turned purple, he managed to get it out. 
If you have your lower animals to contend with, he said, we have our lower classes. This bon mot set the table in a roar, and Mr. Pilkington once again congratulated the pigs on the low rations, the long working hours, and a general absence of pampering which he had observed on Animal Farm. And now, he said finally, he would ask the company to raise to their feet and make certain that their glasses were full. Gentlemen, concluded Mr. Pilkington, gentlemen, I give you a toast to the prosperity of Animal Farm. There was enthusiastic cheering and stamping of feet. Napoleon was so gratified that he left his place and came round the table to clink his mug against Mr. Pilkington's before emptying it. When the cheering had died down, Napoleon, who had remained on his feet, intimated that he too had a few words to say. Like all of Napoleon's speeches, it was short and to the point. He too, he said, was happy that the period of misunderstanding was at an end. For a long time there had been rumours circulated, he had reason to think, by some malignant enemy, that there was something subversive and even revolutionary in the outlook of himself and his colleagues. They had been credited with attempting to stir up rebellion among the animals on neighbouring farms. Nothing could be further from the truth. Their sole wish, now and in the past, was to live at peace and in normal business relations with their neighbours. This farm, which he had the honour to control, he added, was a cooperative enterprise. The title deeds which were in his own possession were owned by the pigs jointly. He did not believe, he said, that any of the old suspicions still lingered, but certain changes had been made recently in the routine of the farm, which should have the effect of promoting confidence still further. Hitherto, the animals in the farm had had a rather foolish custom of addressing one another as comrade, and this was to be suppressed. There had also been a very strange custom, whose origin was unknown, of marching every Sunday morning past a boar's skull, which was nailed to a post in the garden. This, too, would be suppressed, and the skull had already been buried. His visitors might have observed, too, the green flag, which flew from the masthead, if so, they would have perhaps noted that the white hoof and horn with which it had previously been marked had now been removed. It would be a plain green flag from now onwards. He had only one criticism, he said, to make of Mr Pilkington's excellent and neighbourly speech. Mr Pilkington had referred throughout to Animal Farm. He could not, of course, nor, for he, Napoleon, was only now for the first time announcing it, that the name Animal Farm had been a abolished. Henceforward, the farm was to be known as the Manor Farm, which he believed was its correct and original name. Gentlemen, concluded Napoleon, I will give you the same toast as before, but in a different form. Fill your glasses to the brim, gentlemen, here is my toast, to the prosperity of the Manor Farm. There was the same hearty cheering as before, and the mugs were emptied to the dregs. But as the animals outside gazed at the scene, it seemed to them that some strange thing was happening. What was it that had altered in the faces of the pigs? Clover's all dim eyes flitted from one face to another. Some of them had five chins, some had four, some had three. But what was it that seemed to be melting and changing? Then, the applause having come to an end, the company took up their cords and continued the game that had been interrupted, and the animals crept silently away. But they had not gone twenty yards when they stopped short. An uproar of voices was coming from the farmhouse. They rushed back and looked through the window again. Yes, a violent quarrel was in progress. There were shoutings, bangings on the table, sharp, suspicious glances, furious denials. The source of the trouble appeared to be that Napoleon and Mr Pilkington had each played an ace of spades simultaneously. Twelve voices were shouting in anger, and they were all alike. No question now what had happened to the faces of the pigs. The creatures outside looked from pig to man, and from man to pig, and from pig to man again, but already it was impossible to say which was which. <laughs>